Hello learners and uh, welcome to my session on corrective activities for enrichment in EVS. My name is Russell D'Souza and I am from Nirmala Institute of Education, Goa. Well, the structure will have two components. The first one is indicators and uh, the second one is how do we go about planning for correction. Now, let us break the statement that is corrective activities for enrichment into two parts and we would logically get two fragments and the two fragments would be corrective activities and enrichment. So, what is the meaning of corrective activities and enrichment? Well, learners, corrective activities are those activities that are deliberately created or conducted by the teacher based on assessment data and other objective evidences which help to overcome difficulties in learning and enhances performance. So, in other words, what this statement means is that the teacher plans several corrective activities that help a child to overcome the learning gaps that he faces so that he tides over the difficulty and his performance and progress shows a marked improvement. I would like to say, let the child understand the world that he or she lives in and that's a fundamental truth. We need to allow and provide scope for a child to understand the world. If the child finds it difficult, we need to step in and help a child to understand the beauty of the world that he or she lives in. So what correction is needed and where is this correction needed? What are the indicators? Well, I would look at three indicators. The first indicator is the teacher. The second indicator, the course books. And the third indicator, the students. So all three indicators are important. So let us look at the first indicator. That is concerned with teachers. The teaching plan. Do teachers have knowledge about the rationale of EVS in the curriculum? Are teachers aware as to why EVS is a part of the curriculum that they teach? Are they able to conduct a variety of assessments? We conduct maybe orals, we conduct written assessment, but what about performance-based assessment? Do the teachers have the ability to design a variety of tests for students? Do they have the ability to plan varied learning experiences for students that are stimulating, that are interesting, that keep the learner active and engaged, that would help a teacher to determine authentic learning? And I'm coming now to the first one, and that is the teacher's preparedness, that is the content ability to transact EVS. If I take an example of the class 5 textbook that they make use of in Goa, there is a lesson about uh, Sunita in space. And I happened to be going to that particular classroom because I had a lesson that I was to observe. And what I saw on the, on the chalkboard was something interesting. Of course, I do not have a graphic of that, but uh, neither am I using the blackboard or a whiteboard, but I would just try to tell you what this graphic was all about. So the teacher had drawn three circles, one circle around in the second one and the third circle. And um, in the first circle, she had written core, C-O-R-E. The second circle, uh, she wrote the mental, M-A-N-T-L-E. And the last circle, she wrote the crust. So that means 
she represented the three layers of the planet Earth. So the core, the mantle and the crust. And a little outside she drew the a fourth circle, a fourth circle and um, along this fourth circle uh, what she actually drew is uh, Sunita Williams space shuttle and she drew some stars and she put a mark as orbit and there was also sun in the orbit. So that means there was one single orbit and in this orbit there are three things. There are stars, the sun is also there and Sunita Williams space shuttle is also there. I was shocked when I saw this. How was it possible for Sunita Williams to see the core, the crust and the mantle? How was it possible for Sunita Williams space shuttle to be orbiting in the same orbit of the sun? And you also have the stars. So this means that our teachers sometimes do not have their basics right. And we do more damage to children than what damaged children do to themselves. And so it is pertinent and important that we as teachers are conceptually clear about what we teach our children. It's extremely important. Let us look at our course books. Are there conceptual glitches or inadequacies in our course books? Because sometimes they are present in our course books. For example, uh, the course book says, name the animals that you would be able to recognize only by their smell. So, recognizing animals only by their smell without seeing them. And now consider for an example, for an example I take a child uh, very close to a snake and I tell the child, I, 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 take, I tell the child first only, close your eyes, I take the child close to a snake and I tell the child, now smell. Is the child able to smell and tell me it's a snake? Or for that matter, if I take him to maybe uh, you know, a zoo, I close his eyes and I tell him to smell the animals. It is so strange. What could happen if plants could walk? It's illogical. We know that plants do not walk. There's another, uh, there's another thing that in the text which says, jump 30 times. Do you feel breathless? Yes, definitely a child will feel breathless. Now count the number of times you breathe in one minute. I have with my own eyes seen an activity like this being performed in somebody else's class, wherein the child collapsed after jumping 30 times. So we need to be very careful uh, as teachers about what we do. We also talk about earthquakes in one of the lessons and the havoc they create. Could we as teachers and also learners be aware of earthquake resistant structures? About quality steel that goes into structures which has high bendability. So the structures start swaying because of the ductility of the metal. Now, the next one is, what is the relevance and recency of the information that is provided in the textbook? Right here, what you see is a diagram of the tongue. And it says that uh, it, it has regions very clearly marked. Like for example, you have sweet, you have the salty, which is uh, on the sides of the tongue. Then you have the sour taste and at the back you have the bitter taste. Now as learners, if I ask you, how many tastes do we sense? And I'm sure everyone unanimously would say sweet, sour, salty and bitter. Why? Because we have learned about this. We have seen the tongue map. That's the tongue map. So the schematic diagram of the tongue shown on the previous slide that you have just seen very clearly or neatly has marked sections for different taste receptors such as sweet in the front. The front portion of the tongue tastes sweet, sour and salty and bitter at the back. Now this particular map 
has frustrated and it is still frustrating many learners. It has frustrated me as a learner when I was in school because we never got this experiment right. Had we taken a, a, you know, a few grains of sugar, a few crystals of sugar and put somewhere on the tongue here, it still sends sweet. But learners are often told that the sweet taste cannot be sensed at the back of the tongue even if you sense it sweet there. So there are a lot many illogical things that are actually happening. So the tongue map basically came into existence because of a German scientist named D.P. Uh, Hanig. And um, he came to this conclusion based on uh, the observation of his volunteers. So he concluded that sensitivity to the foretaste uh, varied along, varied around the tongue with sweet sensations picking at the tip of the tongue. Well, today, my dear learners, we do not talk about four taste, but rather we talk about five taste. We talk about five taste. And these five tastes are sweet, sour, salty, bitter. And there's another taste that goes by the name umami. That's the savory taste, taste for glutamates. We have approximately 8,000 taste buds and each contains a mixture of receptor cells, allowing them to taste any of our five tastes. And so, you may sense bitter at the tip of the tongue. You may sense sweet at the tip of your tongue. You may sense sour at the tip of your tongue. You may sense salty at the the tip of your tongue. So, we need to bring in new ideas. We need to present before our learners the correct things, the right information. Let's look at the third one, and that is concerned with, with, student, uh, with students as an indicator. So, errors and misunderstanding that are seen when children interact in the classroom. For example, we talk about bastions and machiculations. The textbook talks about bastions and then children wonder, what are machiculations? Well, machiculations are those small, tiny openings, you know, which are narrow inwards, maybe rectangular in shape and they are this way, they, they open outwards. So, machiculations were those spaces through which soldiers who were inside the fort could see what was happening outside. And the reason why it is wider outside is to give a wide angle, a wide sweep. I remember a child telling me that iron can be pumped into our body just like the way water can be pumped into our body. It's strange and surprising. Here is a misunderstanding. It's an error that a child is actually leaving with. A body requires iron. And we get this through the different food that we eat. There's another uh, error that, you know, these children uh, commit. And the moment they see, you know, a place that sells uh, fuel, they will say it's a petrol pump. But the reality is that it is a fuel filling station. Because that fuel filling station may be selling petrol, diesel, or it could be CNG, it could be LPG, etc. Another very common misunderstanding and, uh, and a very huge error that students live with is, is annual rainfall was about 75 centimeters in Goa during the monsoons of 2017. And now children, they wonder, what is this 75 centimeters? And they associate 75 centimeters with height because when we look at height, you know, we look at height of objects, maybe their own height or any other object. And so... I remember this class of students when I happened to enter their class for, uh, for a lesson, uh, you know, they asked me, they said, sir, 75 centimeters or 90 centimeters of rainfall, what does it mean? So if we keep a bucket outside and it continuously rains, we have seen 
floods taking place. We have seen uh, metal barrels getting filled. We have seen water sums getting filled. So what does the 75 centimeters mean? So when we teach a concept to a child, we need to be very, very careful about what we are teaching and what we are explaining to the child. Now, there is also a lack of conceptual clarity. Some children do not know that human beings are animals. And so if you ask them to cite examples of animals, they'll tell you about elephants and tigers and jackals and cats and dogs, but they will not tell you about human beings. We are animals, but there is a difference between us and them. We are rational, we are social. Another, another conceptual clarity is that the moment they see any plant, they will call it a tree. So, they have such difficulties. Or the moment they see a tree, they'll say it's a plant. They're all plants. But there is a certain categorization that is, that is done based on which we categorize plants as trees or herbs or, or climbers or palms or shrubs, whatever the case may be. Then another conceptual uh, difficulty that children face is, you know, today we have the public water supply system. And so, Water comes right up to your doorstep and into your taps, into your kitchen, into your washrooms, whatever it is. And then you ask kids, what are the sources of water? And they will tell you straight away, the source of water is the tap. So you see that our children have so many conceptual difficulties which need to be clarified. And as teachers, we have a major role in trying to clarify those difficulties that students come up with. Sometimes they also have the inability to associate and relate ideas. So associating and relating ideas. How are the ideas associated or related to one another? For example, uh, if I take a piece of you know, aluminium foil, we, we, another mistake that we, that we tend to commit is we call it silver foil, it's aluminium foil. So if you take aluminum foil, two pieces, one I crumble, one I keep it as it is. Both are of the same shape and the same size. Okay. And I leave them in the bucket full of water. Now why is it that one has sunk and one remains floated? Why does one float? Why does the other sink? So, associating, relating ideas. And as teachers, we need to provide opportunities for children to interact with reality. This is reality. Children see, they make use of their senses. So, data that also comes from classroom tests through observational tools that we make use of helps us to understand our learners a lot. Now, these observations that we make could be in class, it could be also out of class. So, now let us look at planning for correction. So, what do teachers need to do? One of the most important things to take into consideration when designing a meaningful lesson is the prior knowledge your students bring to the class. What are their schema? What are the mental images? Students do not enter our classrooms as blank slates. But they bring with them ideas, sometimes well-formed ideas, sometimes misconceptions and misinformed ideas about the way the world works. So we need to be careful to know what information they come to our classroom with, what are their mental schema. Then, your ability and willingness as a teacher to conduct a pre-assessment. A pre-assessment is a test that you would basically give before you begin with your instruction. So a pre-assessment will help you probably to modify your instruction. If at all you need to do it. And this would bring about significant learning for your learners. Address the misconceptions that children hold. Look at the misconceptions that we have discussed in the earlier slides. So those are illustrations for you here. 
One way to do this is to give them what are known as two-tier test before you begin planning or teaching a specific concept. Now, two-tier tests are written assessments that not only ask students for an answer to a problem, but also require students to explain the reasoning behind their answer. Take an example. Uh, snakes remain healthy even after their fangs are removed. So you have yes or no as an answer. So they would either tick mark yes or they would tick mark no. They go to the next step, the second tier. The reason for my answer is one to three and they have to select any of these, either one, two or three. So the first one is snakes leave for many days even after their fangs are removed. A child may mark this answer. Somebody may mark they show a change in behavior, become slow and die. Or yet somebody may also write they develop new fangs, just like human beings get new teeth. So somebody may write the third one. So we are taking our assessment a notch higher because the child is now made to reason at a higher level of understanding. Now, instruction should not always center on the teaching explaining to students. Rather, get students to test out their ideas, to create their own knowledge. For example, you know, we as adults, we as parents, we as teachers tell students that vitamin C tablets should be consumed. Are they good for us as children? Is the question now. How can we know this as children? So instead of telling, let the children find. They are going to construct meaning for themselves. If you tell, then you are robbing them of their freedom to know, to search, to find, to understand, and to form a mental schema, a mental image. Provide feedback to the child, embed formative checks during instruction, administer the diagnostic test, encourage children to ask questions such as what, why, when, how, who, which. Get them to discuss with their peers. Encourage a lot of peer-peer interaction, peer-peer learning. Encourage performance tests. Simple ones. Like for example, what food items do your do your peers eat? So, what does he eat? What does he eat? What does he eat? What does she eat? And how would you present these findings? Would you make use of a table? Would you make use of a chart? How would you present your findings? So, get students to go beyond. Get students to involve their own reasoning. Get students to interact. Let them learn socially with other children in the classroom. Get students to work on collaborative projects. Get them to read about different birds and the kinds of beaks that they have. Also find out if there is a relationship between the kind of beak that a bird has and the food that they eat. So kinds of beaks and the food that they eat. What is the relationship? Let them find out. Give this as collaborative projects to children. Build a rapport with the community such that you can invite them when you need them to partner with your classroom instruction to foster and strengthen learning. Remember that many a times we need professionals from the external world to come into our school. And when I, mean the when I say the external world, I mean the community. Because teachers at all times can't handle all topics. If I'm talking about health, it would be nice for a doctor from the community to come and talk to the children about health. If I'm, if I'm, looking, if I'm looking at maybe plants and I'm looking at um, different preparations that can be made by using these plants to better our health, then I would need probably a person who, who prepares such formulations to come and talk to the children. So we need to build a lot of linkages with the community, the community in which 
the school is embedded. Remember that community school partnerships are extremely important when we look at fruitful learning. So, as teachers, we need to also differentiate instruction so that it impacts the variety of learners who are a part of our classrooms. Our class learners are different. Our classrooms are heterogeneous. They are not homogeneous. They are heterogeneous. By heterogeneous, I mean our learners are different. So you have some learners who have certain abilities, some learners who do not have those abilities. And therefore, we need to use a variety of strategies. For example, brainstorming, drawing cartoons, dance, singing. So use a variety of strategies. And there is a theory known as the theory of multiple intelligences that was put forth by Howard Gardner, an American psychologist. He, in fact, uh, proposed nine different intelligences. Of course, I have eight with me here, uh, beginning with uh, naturalistic intelligence. And this type of intelligence you can, you can actually develop by, by encouraging children to interact with nature. So you have nature trails, you have field trips, you have learning that takes place out of the classroom. You have linguistic intelligence wherein you can make children to write maybe poems. Poems, we call them poems, but the pronunciation is poems. So they write poems or visual spatial that is, draw a family tree that shows your relationship with your cousins and your uncles and your aunties and so on and so forth. Musical, uh, that is uh, in class tree, um, a poem or a poem that talks about water or water, give it rhythm. Interpersonal, interaction discussion with other children. Intrapersonal, within myself. So how would, how would I as a learner conserve and save water? Logical. So there are different intelligences. Kinesthetic is concerned with movement. Uh, for example, have a lot of games, have a lot of dance. So we involve our learners in all these activities. One very important thing that we need to remember is that assessment that we as teachers make must always be followed by corrective instruction. Corrective instruction, remember learners, is not the same thing as reteaching. It does not mean reteaching. Rather, it's a mix of strategies that address different learning styles and intelligences of our learners. So you need to look at the learning styles and intelligences that our learners have. And accordingly, you're going to mix different learning strategies and present corrective measures. Plan a variety of resources. So you can have dramatization, you can have um, drama, you can have experimentation, field trips, field learning. Advantages. Helps a learner to build mastery. So correction. Helps a learner to build mastery. Helps a learner to self-reflect. Helps a teacher to have a better understanding about his or her practice as a teacher. It enhances performance. So if I go through this entire session, we have looked at three indicators. Uh, that is the teacher, our course books, and the student himself or herself. And how the teacher can plan for correction so that corrective measures can be adopted and children can be helped to move over the difficulties, over the barriers, over the misconceptions and the misunderstanding that they come with. Thank you very much.